weeks back, we started the teaching series on the supernatural. The supernatural, and by the grace of God, we'll be rounding up tonight. We have seen what the supernatural is. We live in a natural world, but the supernatural is real, very, very real. And it's important for us to have an understanding of the supernatural. In these end times, so many things are all over the place. But those who know their God will be strong and they will do exploits. So in the first one, we looked at the supernatural and we looked at the sources. And we saw that God is the creator of all power. All power in heaven and on earth has been given unto Jesus. And uh, some of the creatures unto whom he delegated the power to function effectively misuse. And one of such is the devil. But we know God is sovereign and his, his power surpasses every other power. Yes, there may be other powers, but power past power. The supernatural by the power of God's spirit. We saw types of men, ordinary men, carnal, and we saw the Jew, Gentile, or Christian, the natural, the carnal, and the spiritual. And our aim for us to experience and enjoy the supernatural is to be the spiritual spiritual man, man because the spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We saw life in the supernatural, which is God's desire for his children. The supernatural is not supposed to be a once in a while, annual or biannual thing that happens to us. We are expected to live, to enjoy, to experience life in the supernatural, a lifestyle in the supernatural. And we saw some of the secrets to the supernatural life. We must know who you are. The Bible says a man that is honored and does not know it is like a beast that perishes. So it's important to know who we are. We must believe the scriptures, which is the foundation of our faith. We must not try to rationalize or subject it to scientific analysis or explanation. It's beyond the ordinary. That is why it is supernatural. And we must believe that scriptural experiences can also be yours. Thank God for what we are reading in the Bible. But well, everything we read in the Bible by, of God's demonstration of his power can happen to us because he's the same. His power has not changed. His power has not diminished. We saw the place of faith in the word of God. The supernatural is based on the word of God because God will only confirm his word. What God has not said, he's not bound to confirm it. So we saw that we need to walk by faith. And we saw examples of Old Testament and New Testament people who walked by faith. So, and we saw how things that were seen were made out of the things that were, not, I mean, things which were seen were not made of things which are visible. We saw the place of prayer, which is a communication between God and man. We saw that we can pray for the supernatural, we can pray into the supernatural, and we can pray with the supernatural resources that God has given unto us. We saw the place of holiness, holiness without which no man can see the Lord. The holiness should be a way of life. We saw scriptural examples, Old Testament, New Testament. We are blessed. We, 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 we don't say we are Old Testament Christian or New Testament is our major. The Bible is our syllabus. The practices of God, we see them in the Old Testament. The practices, I mean, the principles, the practices may be different, but God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And last week, we saw the place of obedience. Obedience as a way of life. We saw so many examples. Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Elijah, Jesus, Ananias, Paul, Philip, and it's inexhaustive. Obedience is the key to the supernatural. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I'm sure by the time we're going through this series, you'll be wondering, which is next? Which is next? Practically, kilo tsunku. But there is always cool with the word of God. And so tonight, we take the, of course, we say it here, is not exhaustive. If in the course of your personal Bible study, you can add other things, but just make sure there is biblical base 
for whatever you are adding to the list. Now, tonight we are looking at the place of unity. The place of unity. And you will agree with me that the place of unity in the supernatural cannot be overemphasized. We cannot overemphasize the importance of unity for us to experience, for us to enjoy the supernatural. Unity is a key and very, very important factor. Psalm 133, verses 1 to 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How good and pleasant, how good and wonderful it is. It's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garment. It's like the dew of Hammon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. We just finished our anniversary about a month ago, and the theme was fresh dew, fresh dew. And we are seeing the place of unity, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commanded his blessing. So we have, if we recollect the last day of the anniversary, Bishop Adela talked about commanded blessing in place of unity. Introduction. It is commonly said that there is strength in unity. There is strength in unity. When we are together, the, the, I mean, there is what they call synergy, what one person can accomplish if you compare it to what we can accomplish together. Team, I said, they said, together everyone achieve more. When we come together in unity, so there is strength in unity. And united we stand, divided we fall. The Bible actually says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So there cannot be the supernatural. We cannot experience or enjoy the supernatural when we are at cross purposes, when there is division, when there is rebellion, when we are not working together. But where there is unity, there is so much strength. The Yoruba has a, something, a reference. If you take a broomstick and try to bend it, I'm talking about the stick, just one. Is it stick? St eh? Strand. Ah, okay. One strand of, from the broom, easily. But if you take the broom, even though brooms are expensive now, I wanted to say a 10 naira broom, but I'm sure it, it, maybe 500 will be the base for, you to, for somebody to hold broom. You cannot be, that, no matter how powerful you are, you cannot. So there is strength in unity. United we stand, divided we fall. The psalmist even likened unity to the anointing. The anointing, which is the power, the presence, the power and presence of God upon a thing or a person, is likened to unity. In where we read in Psalm 133, is like the precious oil. That's the anointing upon the head of Aaron. In the Old Testament, when Aaron was to be was to be ordained into the priesthood, the oil, the anointing oil, was poured upon his head, as we saw in Exodus 30:30. 30, 30. And you shall anoint Aaron and his son and consecrate them that they may, be minister, that they may minister to me as priests. So before they entered into that office, they had to be anointed so that they can effectively perform their service unto the Lord. And we are saying, we are saying from the Bible that unity is like the anointing and also likened to supernatural dew. I mean, all the ministers... From different angles, we've heard about the dew, the fresh dew, supernatural dew. We ca you cannot conjure dew. It's of God. It's from God. And it's silent operation of God. What is beyond man? There are so many things that science has been able to do, but I've not read that they have been able to make dew to fall. So it's like the dew of Hammon that descended. So in the first demonstration of human unity in the Bible, 
man was able to achieve anything even beyond the natural. When we are together in unity with one purpose, one focus, one objective, there's nothing, nothing, I mean, that's in the natural. I mean, nothing that we will not be able to achieve. And we saw the example in the book of beginnings in Genesis, Genesis chapter 11 from verses 1 to 7. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they, came, they found a plain in the land of China and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had bricks for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them because they are united of one mind, of one purpose, of one focus. And so God said, come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. That was the first human experience of unity. They set out and God in heaven had to recognize that because they are of one language, of one purpose, of one focus, there's nothing that they imagine to do that will be restrained from them. So there's so much power in unity. And if we, if we look at it in other spheres of life, if you see a team, a football team, where they are all working together towards a purpose, the purpose is to win the club, I mean the the league, and they are together with one purpose, one focus, no distraction, no dissension, they will perform better than a team two weeks to World Cup. They will bring this one from here, bring that one from there, and first round, of course, as usual, we won't go beyond that. So there is power in unity. When we are united, we are able to do beyond the natural elements of unity. Now, what is unity all about? Many times what we call unity is not unity. When somebody A is thinking this way, B is thinking the other way. Of course, God is so awesome that we can know our minds. We can be seated together and I may be smiling and nodding my head, but in my mind, I'm just saying, I'm a yimu to the person in my mind that you don't know what you are doing. That is not unity. So unity is an agreement of more than one person in spirit, mind, and action. So before we can talk about unity, it must involve more than one person. Unity of more than one person in spirit, in mind, and action. First Thessalonians 5.23 talks about man being a trapatite being, has a spirit, soul, and a body. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. Third John 2 talks about your soul prospering as your spiritual life, your health, everything, to the total man. So there must be, when we talk about unity, everyone, acting together as one, with one purpose, in one accord, in alignment. And in today's world, we say we are on the same page. But you know, sometimes you can be on the same page and not reading the same book. There's no unity. If you are reading Animal Farm and you're on page 10, and somebody else is reading Ibo Rumole on page 10, you are both on page 10 but you are not reading the same book. So it means reading the same book and being on the same page. Everyone in alignment, in, in, in harmony, in accord. And that's why we said agreement. We must be in agreement in spirit, 
mind, and action. And it is characterized by one language. The one language is in inverted comma. It's not before you have unity, everybody must be speaking Hausa or Igbo or Yoruba or Spanish. No. But that there is a perfect understanding, a perfect understanding so that we are on the same page. We have the same goal, the same focus, the same objective, the same direction towards a particular purpose. So it must be by one language. Genesis 11, 6 to 7, we read that earlier. The people, were, they had one language. The people are one and they have one language. It's important, perfect understanding. First Corinthians 14, talking about spiritual gifts and speaking in tongues, verse 6 says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? If, as I came up here to minister, and since then I've just been speaking in tongues, some people may have falling asleep, some may go out, some may, some who are courageous may come and meet Pastor Dotunpe, she go see. Because you'll be wondering, what is she saying? It's a teaching service. So there must be perfect understanding, 16 to 17. So otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you are saying? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So yes, you are speaking mysteries unto God, but we are not in accord. You are not in agreement. You are not in harmony with somebody else, except the person can interpret what you are saying. So we are saying it's important. And sometimes I've discovered, sometimes, many times, let me say, there was a time many times I will give instruction to my subordinate and he will do something or she will do something else. I had to sit and ask myself, am I communicating? We are not of the same language. So it's important when we talk about unity. And that's why the Bible says the vision, write it, let it be plain. There must be understanding so we know that we are talking about the same thing. One purpose. There must be a common purpose, a common objective. Not somebody coming together. I mean, using the, the body, the church now. Our objective is church growth. Meanwhile, somebody's objective is for a rich guy to come to church to toast her. That's not unity. Because we are, not, we are not of the same purpose. So there must be one objective, one purpose for the team, for the football, for the team to win the match. For us to serve God, for us to make heaven, for us to win soul. And everybody have that common understanding. There must be one purpose. Genesis 11, 4. It was clearly stated what they wanted to do. Come, let us build ourselves a city. There was no ambiguity. And a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make, I mean, there are objectives. I, for those who are in management or who are, you can pick four or five different objectives from just this one verse of scriptures. So it was clearly defined. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. So it says, when you come together, each of you has a psalm, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If everybody has access, as I'm speaking now, somebody at the back is shouting and saying, oh, oh God has shown me something. Somebody from that corner is standing and saying, yes, Nigeria or Trump will win the election. And somebody is saying, Indomi, by tomorrow, you will sell for 50 naira. There will be confusion. God is not the author of confusion. So there must be one purpose and one pursuit. The strategy. How do we want to achieve our purpose? How do we want to go about it? What is the focus? Is, is the purpose? What is our focus? What is our strategy? 
to work together as a team. Every month, everyone seeing him or herself as part of it, that the contribution is not so that I will be seen or I will be known. In a football team, if they are, they are united, they are working as a team in unity, it will matter whether it's, don't let me say names now, but whether it's Messi, I don't know whether Messi is still playing football, or is uh, your adopted son, ah, Saka, okay. Whether it's Saka that scored, or whether it is Oliver, or Chukudi, what is important is we win. But you know, sometimes when they are playing, because somebody wants to, so that they will know that I scored two goals. Sometimes I, we are two. So when he's watching, what will I be doing? First to watch. It will be clear that, ah, if he has passed that ball to somebody else, that one would have been in a better position to score. But because he wants to take the glory that I'm the one that has scored, he will do it himself. And But if the focus, the pursuit is the same, then we will accomplish more. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. Jesus gave the, them instruction that they should tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. And so when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in unity together with a purpose waiting for the outpouring of God's spirit even upon them. So for us to walk in unity, for us to be united, some will have to saw, drop their ideas. That's important. Their positions and desire and accept those of others. Amos 3.3 says, can two walk together except they are agreed? If you hold on to your position, if you hold on to your belief, to your ideas, and there are superior arguments, so to say, in a team. You are not working in unity. So there are some things we need to let go. There are some ideas, positions, status. I'm the head of the family, but when you get to a larger place and you are seeing people bringing in superior arguments for the purpose of unity and accomplishing your purpose, you may have to drop your ideas and accept those of others. First Corinthians 12 14 to 17. In fact, for in fact, the body is not one mem member but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? Let's try to imagine, it. as God made us, somebody should just be eyes. The kinescopola is just eyes. The kinestaiwo is nose. Just try to imagine how we would be. But God has so much arranged everything that you cannot say, I don't need this. The body of Christ is one. And we have a focus, we have a mission, we have a purpose, which is to reach out into the world and bring men to the saving knowledge of God and to ensure that we ourselves get there. So we are one. You won't say because I'm not a Baptist, I don't go to redeem, I'm not part of this. No, it's one, it's one body. Verse 21. And the eye cannot say to the land, to the hand, I have no need of you. How will it eat if he says it has no need of hand? nor the head to the feet, I have no need. So we, God has put every part of the body in alignment and they are functioning perfectly well. That's why we can sit down comfortably, we can stand, we can walk. When somebody is sick, there's no unity in the body. That's what it means. But when there is unity, the head is coordinating, the hand, the leg, the nose, everything, it will work perfectly well. Now, scriptural examples Old Testament saints triggered the supernatural whenever they walked or walked in unity. Walking and walking in unity. We saw the example of Moses when he led the children of Israel through the wilderness. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, he talked about all of them passed through the sea. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all 
all, all pass under the cloud. All pass through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Unity. One accord. All of them. It was not, there was, it was, I mean, there was even no opportunity for someone to say, I don't want manna. I'm going to cook Indomie instead of rice. All of them, they were all baptized unto Moses. They all passed through the cloud. They all did this. They all did that. Joshua, in Joshua chapter 6, verse 15 to 16. This was the destruction of Jericho. God gave an instruction to Joshua. They were to march around the city once every day. And on the last day, and there was no one. I mean, if we look at it in the, with the ordinary eyes, we want to take a city. And you are saying we should just walk around. What type of strategy is that? But there was no dissension. And because they were united on the seventh day when he gave the instruction, it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times. Some people could have said by the fifth time, ah, oh, Benny, why are you seven times? We've been doing this thing six days, no, nothing to show for it. But they all did it, and at the end of the day, the walls of Jericho crashed. I mean, from historical records, they, they claim the wall was very, very thick, and the wall fell straight down ahead of them. That was not ordinary. They didn't use dynamite. They didn't use hammer or anything. Just shouting. That was supernatural in place of unity. Gideon. Gideon was to go to war. And he was going to war with 32 people. 32,000. And God said... They were too many. And he said, anyone who is afraid, and 10,000, was it 10,000? Anyway, read the earlier verses of that chapter. And God said there were still too many when about 10,000 departed. And he did a test for them. Then the remaining, he was left with just 30. 30 from 32. 300, thank you. And he gave instructions. He divided it into camp. That was the strategy. And they all cooperated. They all aligned. They were in harmony, in one accord, with 300 from 32,000. So that we know that it's supernatural. It's by the hand of God. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpet at every side of the whole camp, and says the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpet and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew. The three companies, a company did not dissent. A company did not renege on what was agreed. They were in unity. And they broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their hands and the trumpets in their hands for the blowing. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon as they were instructed. And every man stood in the camp all around, in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried and fled and God gave them that victory because they were together in unity and in one accord. Gideon, Judges 7, 16 to 22. When, oh, I think I've said what is in Judges instead of Joshua. We have, I've said what is in Judges Joshua 6, 15 to 16. Six. 
Praise the Lord. Bear with me. We have looked at Joshua. We have looked at Gideon. Those are Old Testament. They enjoyed the supernatural hand of God when people did things in unity. When they did things in unity, they experienced the supernatural. If you recall Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 20, when the armies came against him, he was afraid. He, he said he didn't know what to do. He called the people together and everybody in verse 13, the Bible says, all together, the men, the women, the children, now all Judah with their little ones, their children, wives, and they stood before the Lord. And as they cried unto the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord came upon the prophet Jahaziel and he gave them the strategy. They all came together. He declared a fast and in unity the supernatural was made manifest. The Shekinah glory of God, which is the manifested presence of God, was revealed at the dedication of the temple as the people worshipped in unity. When Solomon's temple was being dedicated, the singers, the everyone, they came together, and as they sang praises, the glory of God, God manifested himself in their midst. Second Chronicles 5, 12 to 14. And the Levites, who were the singers, and those of Asaph and Herman and Jeduthut, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, string instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests, sounding the trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass, when the trumpeters and singers were as one, in unity, in one accord, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lift up, lifted up their voice with the trumpet and cymbals and instruments of music, and praised the Lord, saying, For the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever, that the house of the Lord was filled with the clouds, so that the priests could not continue to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. They were blowing together in one accord, together with the singers, the praise worship team, the instrumentalists, the, or the congregation, everybody, every focus was upon the Lord, and God came down. It was supernatural. Also, in captivity, unity among slaves brought supernatural revelation. In Daniel chapter 2, the king had a dream, and he forgot the dream. He called the astrologers together and said they should tell him the dream and the interpretation, which they could not. And the king issued a decree that every one of them should be killed. And Daniel, in wisdom, asked for time. And he went back to his company, his friends. And then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies together in unity, in one accord, concerning the secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Unity brought about the supernatural. What the astrologers could not do in place of prayer and unity, one accord, three men, three, four men called upon the name of the Lord and God revealed that unto them. In the ministry of Jesus, Jesus lived and ministered supernaturally in unity with the Father. He says, is what I hear my father say that I, what I hear my father do is what I'm doing. He did not do anything outside of the father. John 5, 19 to 21. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the son of man can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does it. They are Walking together in sync, in alignment. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than this that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son. So he walked in unity, in one accord with the Father. John 8, 28 to 29. Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak 
these things. John 10, 30 says, I and the Father, we are one. I and the Father, we are one. In Matthew 27, 46, this was at the cross, and this was the only time that he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we know it was at that stage when the sin of the whole world was imputed unto him. And we know the eyes of the Lord are too holy to behold iniquity. Also, with the Holy Spirit, in John 1, 32 to 33, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, he, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was upon Jesus and he walked in unity with him. In Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So we saw God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit walking together in unity, in alignment, in harmony, in accord, and there was no situation, no circumstance was beyond Jesus. Everywhere he went, the supernatural followed him. There were results. The sick were healed, the oppressed were delivered, yokes were destroyed, but he was not doing it on his own or for his own glory. He was doing it in, in consonance with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus was, as he wound up his ministry, he prayed for unity among believers and with the Trinity for the supernatural. I mean, the importance of unity in the valedictory speech, I call John 17 the valedictory speech of Jesus. There are so many things he's, he prayed about for the church there, but one of the things he prayed about was unity. I do not pray for this alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one unity as you, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one. I mean, these three or four verses, one, 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 there, if you count it, there are about four. Unity, emphasizing it, the need for us to be one. And when we talk about unity in the body of Christ, it's not that everybody will worship under the same umbrella. Everyone will turn to Pentecostal, everyone will turn to, there are no denominations in heaven. The body of Christ is one, one in purpose, one in action. We'll see it as we go along. The apostolic church, that's the early church, they experienced the supernatural as she operated in unity. Unity preceded, preceded the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost has fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. One sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were together in unity, in one accord. And the Holy Spirit came upon them with evidence of speaking in other tongues. Acts 42 to 47. And they continued, that's the disciples, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders, many wonders and signs were done through the apostles because they were united. Now all who believed together had all things in common, and so their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord, accord again, unity, in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity, of hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church. So growth, fruitfulness, productivity, increase, enlargement will come in place of unity, as we are seeing from the early church. Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. Now, after uh, they have 
healed in the name of Jesus, the man at the beautiful gate, the lame man, and they were arrested. And being let go, they went to their company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard this, they raised their voice to God with one accord. So when we come together for prayers, whether we are praying for Nigeria, we are praying for Ibadan City, we are praying for Vine Branch, we should have one focus, one purpose, one pursuit. It's not just all about God, please. They are raising prayer points. We are praying for Nigeria, we are praying for Vine Branch for growth, and I say, ah, God, please. Ah, this breakthrough. If only you are not in harmony with us, you are not in alignment, in agreement, in unity with us. 31 to 33. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaking, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart, unity, one soul, working together in unity for a common, for a common purpose. Acts 12, 5 to 7, this was, prayer was being made for, for Peter when he was arrested and he was to be killed, but prayers was being offered for him. Occurrences of disunity were quickly tackled, resulting in greater manifestation of the natural of the supernatural where there is division where there is evil there is strife there is malice the bible says every evil work will also abound therein but where there is unity we are together of one purpose then we can be sure that the supernatural so anything that we threaten unity of the body that we threaten the unity of the family that we threaten the unity of the team must be quickly, quickly tackled and, uh, and uh, addressed, resulting in greater manifestation of the supernatural. In Acts 5, 10 to 16, there's a story of Ananias and Sapphira who told a lie and both of them, husband and wife, lost their lives. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. Great fear came upon all the church and upon those who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostle, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch and, and so on and so forth. The issue of Ananias and Sapphira was they didn't allow it to linger. It was dealt with, and thereafter, the church grew. They experienced so much of the supernatural. So we should not tolerate or we should not allow anything that we, that we threaten the unity of the body. And unfortunately, there are people whose own ministry is to attack the body of Christ. God will have mercy on them. Ask Chapter 6, verse 1, there was, now in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution of food. I mean, they were sharing and caring for one another. And before you knew it, there were winning winnies. It's those that belong to Peter that they are giving more food. When we come, they will tell us to go and wait. We we'll wait in the some three hours, but it was addressed immediately in Acts 15. This was at the Jerusalem Council. There, are some some Jews arose and said the Gentiles must be circumcised before they can become Christians, and this was taken before the council in Jerusalem. And certain men came down from Judea and told the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, when Paul and Barnabas had, had no small dissension and disputes with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So when they were sent off, they went to Antioch and when they had gathered the multitudes together, they delivered the letter and they called a council and they deliberated, they discussed and said no. At the end of it all, they said it, it pleased the Holy Spirit and us that we should put no further burden on the Gentiles. What we 
the born Jews, what we could not adhere to. Why do we have to compel them? And they just gave them, they should refrain from food offered to idols, from immoralities, and, and I think from, and to give to the poor. And a letter was thereafter sent even to convey this so that the, the doctrine of Christ will not be corrupted. 30 to 32. And please let me to thank Emmanuel. He has been doing good tonight. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. That's the letter from the council now. And when they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas themselves being prophets also exalted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So the believers were strengthened, they were encouraged even to go on rather than allowing the rift or the confusion to, to linger. Now, the essence of unity. Unity enables the church to function as the body of Christ. We have seen that Jesus Christ, the Father, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, they operated together in unity, in alignment. If Christ is the head and we are the body, then the body of Christ also ought to work and operate in unity. When we work in unity, it will enable us to work perfect, to function effectively as the body of Christ. First Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are also are one body, so also is Christ. Christ is not divided. Christ is not divided. Christ, the body of Christ, is one. Ephesians 4 from verse 1. We won't get to 16, but maybe 8. Now, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, I peace. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. There is one body. Whether deeper life, whether new covenant, whether vine branch, there is one body. And one spirit, just as you were called in one hope, one hope, one purpose, one faith, one baptism. You can't be baptized to any other thing. You can only be baptized in the name of, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One God and, one, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of the gift of christ therefore when he ascended he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men and he went for that to talk about the ministry the pulpit, the ministry gift and so on and so forth but we have seen that there is one faith one baptism one body it's one in unity and we have that responsibility to keep the bond of unity and it's then that we experience the fullness of the power of god disunity dissension and division on the other hand negates the supernatural where there's division division there's dissension there's disunity the supernatural will not manifest in such places. In Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, this was Miriam and uh, Aaron who spoke against Moses. And what happened? She became leprous and she had to slow down the entire camp, the journey, the entire journey by seven days because she had to be cleansed of her leprosy before they could proceed. In Numbers 16, you have uh, Detam, Koram, and Abira who said, is, is it only Moses that God is speaking to? We also, God can hear from God and more or less they challenged the authority and what has never happened before happened to them. The, the ground opened up and swallowed them and all that they have. So a child of God should not be a party 
to rebellion, to dissension, to disunity. If we say we are one, even in family, in our nuclear family, in our extended family, where there is unity, supernatural will be a regular occurrence. Acts chapter 5, 1 to 2. That's, we, read that, we didn't read it, but we referred to it earlier on the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who wanted to show off, but they ended up losing their life. Unity accentuates the natural authority of believer into the realm of the supernatural. The natural authority that we have as believers, when we walk in unity, it will, it will translate it, it will make it more prominent, the supernatural in our lives. We will move into the realm of the supernatural. Deuteronomy 32, 30 says, how could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord has surrounded has surrendered them. When we walk in unity, then what is beyond the ordinary, the supernatural, will be a common occurrence in our lives. But where there is self-seeking, where there is confusion, every evil work will abound. In conclusion, the church can experience the limitless power of God. God is not limited by any situation, by any circumstances. And he has given unto us the power here on earth to occupy until he comes. So when we take our place, walking in unity as family units, as a church, as part of the body of Christ, as activity team, as a house fellowship, having one purpose, one focus, one pursuit, which is to bring glory to God, not in competition, not in rebellion, not in disunity, then there's no limit to the power of God that we will experience. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 6, neither circumcision nor circumcision avails anything, but faith which works by love. If you claim you have faith without works, and your works is done without love, in that same James, he says, somebody comes to you who is hungry, who is desolate, and you are saying, the Lord bless you and keep you. Go in peace. You have not done anything. In Matthew 18, 15 to 19, says, moreover, if your brother sin against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. If he will not hear, take him. Take with him two or more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you, two is heavenly quorum, shall agree in unity, in one accord concerning anything. This is an open check that they ask. It will be done for you by my Father who is in heaven. God has made provision for us to walk in unity. And as we walk in unity, there will be no limit of the supernatural hand of God that we will experience. Let's bow down our heads and appreciate God for these eight weeks of teaching of the supernatural we don't take these teachings because we, we just feel like taking them but it's because that is what god desire for that's what god wants to do even at this time he wants to move in our midst like never before he wants us to experience the supernatural i want us to individually desire and hunger for the supernatural in this assembly in our individual lives, in our family units, in the body of Christ, more of the supernatural power as in the days of old. Those things that we read in the Bible that we begin to see blind eyes open, the, 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 the lame walk, 
difficult situation, impossible situations being turned around, that those things that we have experienced in time past, that the Lord will do them again, that the Lord will visit this vine, that the supernatural will be a regular occurrence, that when we come together, even for the miracle service, there will be miracles, miracles, what only God can do, the Lord will do in our midst, in the name of Jesus, and make up your mind as an individual to walk in love, to walk in unity, that you will be an agreeable person. You will live in harmony, in one accord, in unity, in sync with other people in the name of Jesus. If there are ideas, there are ideas, there are, there are beliefs that, be, that, that are limiting you, that are not making you to walk in agreement, in unity with other team members, ask God for grace. The grace of God is available. God is set even to do the miraculous in our midst in Jesus' name. And the Bible says, as Jesus Christ began to teach, the power of God was available. The power of God is available tonight. You desire a supernatural touch in your life, in any area of your life. Get on your feet and tell the Lord that area where you need divine intervention, that what only God can do. As we have gone through this series, we believe in the power of the supernatural, that the Lord will pass through this congregation, every need, every situation, every circumstance, Heavenly Father, that your sons and daughters are presenting before you. Lord, we receive an answer of peace in the name of Jesus Christ. We believe you to stretch forth your hand in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that you will heal the sick, you will deliver the oppressed, you will break the yoke, O oh God, in the the name of Jesus. Doubtless we will return, O oh God, with thanksgiving. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we have prayed.